Okay, um, let's get started on this session on the social discount rate. Um, the social discount rate is a topic that's clearly foundational to one of the themes that has been emphasized by many of the speakers throughout this conference, which is that it's essential to put a price on carbon in order to make sensible investment and policy choices. Um, for instance, the wide uncertainty bans around the social cost of carbon that we saw in Sarah Breeden's presentation yesterday is partly of a reflection about the long time horizons involved in the uncertainty about discount rates. Um, so I had the privilege of commissioning these papers for a special issue of the Annual Review of Financial Economics with the aim of drawing more attention uh, by financial researchers to this important measurement issue and its practical and conceptual challenges. Um, so I'm very pleased that some of these authors who have been true thought leaders in this area will be sharing their work with you today. So let me turn it over to Christian Gallier, who's going to be the first presenter. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, so thank you for the invitation. Do you see my, uh, my screen? Yes. I, I believe, yes. So. Um, the starting point of my paper is uh, about uh, the fact that for several decades now, uh, most Western countries uh, have used uh, a single discount rate to evaluate, to, to evaluate all public investment and policies. Um, and so uh, th that imply that uh, by ignoring risk, uh, there is a clear misallocation of capital and that misallocation of capital entails a large welfare loss. Uh, although we know for maybe more than 50 years now that, uh, and coming from the asset pricing literature, uh, that there is a strong normative uh, argument in favor of adjusting the discount rate to the riskiness of the risk profile of the project under scrutiny. Uh, and so, so the main idea is uh, uh, we should value more investment projects that generate more benefits in the worst state of nature. Uh, so for example, we have seen during the crisis, the, the COVID crisis, that uh, ICUs are particularly useful uh, when, uh, we ha when we have a pandemic. Uh, and uh, in most pandemic, we have a, a, down, a, a, a downturn, uh, an economic downturn. So, so you see large value when we have a recession, uh, that's the pro project investment that generate that kind of risk profile are particularly useful. And so we value more that kind of project with the negative correlation with the, between the benefits and aggregate consumption. That is done by using a smaller discount rate for that kind of project. On the contrary, railways, typically railways have a, a larger benefit when uh, it, the economy grows faster because there is a larger demand for transportation. In that case, the, 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 the risk profile is less favorable. Most of the, many, most of the benefits think are, are obtained when, when the economy is in, in good shape, which make them less useful in terms of producing uh, value, value for society. So, so this idea implied that we should take into account this kind of risk profile when we value a project, when we do that by adjusting the discount rate to to that risk profile. And this risk profile is summarized typically by one number, which is the income elasticity of the net benefits of the project. Uh, so the intuition is simple. The welfare benefit of the reform is large. Uh, and the methodology is not very complex because just add to the, to the difficult the complexity of the evaluation, uh, the estimation of this income elasticity. So uh, what do we have around the world about these issues of adjusting uh, the discount rate to the risk profile? Well, in the US, it's still hard to understand what you are doing. Uh, the official discount rate is 7%, but there is a possibility to evaluate the project using a discount rate of 3% for reasons that are 
obscure to me. I mean, whether the investment project is financed by reducing consumption or by uh, displacing capital from, from productive capital in the economy. I mean, that does not make much sense, and I have no idea how to estimate uh, the, how, how a, a public project is funded through uh, displacement of capital or through reducing consumption. And that makes no sense to me. So um, in the UK, the discount rate is 3.5 percent currently, with an exception of uh, for for health benefit uh, that should be discounted at only 1.5 percent. In the Netherlands, uh, the discount rate currently, since last year, in fact, is 2.25 percent, except for and here you, we see the kind of thing uh, that is more useful. Uh, we should discount uh, less risky cost at a lower rate of 1.6 percent. And we should discount uh, highly uncertain benefits that are those who are, which are highly dependent on the state to the state of the economy at a discount rate of 2.9%. Uh, finally, uh, and here you see one of the one of my contribution to the world, I've I convinced over the last uh, 10 years to make sure that in France we use the uh, the normative approach of uh, of a discount rate that is risk adjusted. So if beta is the income elasticity of the benefits of the project, the discount rate that should be used for that project is 2.5% plus 2% times beta. So a risk-free project should be discounted at 2.5%. Uh, a risky project with a beta of one should be discounted at four. 4.5%. Okay, so that's, uh, I think, uh, a good idea. Let me explain why. That's, that's the difficult slide of uh, my presentation, but it's completely standard. Uh, here I'm just summarizing the cap consumption based capital asset pricing model. Uh, if uh, BT denote the benefits of the project at time t, typically it's a random variable. Uh, there may be different state of nature that will generate uh, different BT, benefit for the project. Uh, the, the present value of this project should be equal to, well, the, expected, the expectation of, of the product of the net benefit by the marginal rate of substitution uh, between consumption at the T instead S and uh, consumption today. Well, this is uh, Econ 101. Huh? Uh, and so the idea is to replace this formula by uh, stating that well, in, in the case of expected utility, this marginal rate substitution is just the ratio of marginal utility. And um, so you obtain this and eventually you can rewrite this, uh, this term into discounting at rate rho the expected benefit. Uh, materializing at, at the T with the rho, the discount rate, the socially, discount, uh, socially desirable discount rate is defined in this way using the, uh, this equation. In the special case of the calibration of this formula using the assumption of a geometric Brownian motion for growth of consumption with the constant relative risk aversion gamma and uh, constant elasticity income elasticity of the net benefit. Uh, uh, you see beta here is this income elasticity of the, uh, of the net benefits of the project. Uh, and here is an idiosyncratic risk. You obtain the standard CCAPM uh, formula where the discount rate, the socially discount rate corresponding to a project whose income elasticity is beta, it should be discounted at a risk-free rate plus a risk premium, which is proportional to beta, where the risk-free rate and the risk premium are dependent upon the parameters of the model, which is the degree of risk aversion gamma, the trend of growth mu, and the volatility of growth sigma squared, uh, sigma. And uh, well, beta is easy to estimate if you, uh, if you, for example, use a Monte Carlo simulation to estimate the, 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 the net benefit in different data, different, in different state of nature, uh, you just regress the log of the net benefit at time t to the log of aggregate consumption at the t, and, and your OLS estimator of beta give you 
this uh, this beta that you should put into into the risk adjustment formula okay so if we do that we know that we have uh, uh, asset pricing puzzles the risk free rate puzzles and the uh, and the equity premium puzzle you will get a risk free rate which is too large compared to what we observe in the market and a risk premium which is way too small and so there are there has been typically two roads to solve the problem the first one resolution one is abstains in preference uh, and long on risk, uh, but uh, I have uh, I have uh, difficulty, uh, philosophical difficulty to use this approach because you know under the veil of ignorance, which is a typical uh, idea uh, when we want to make uh, judgment about the uh, so desirability of an action, under the veil of ignorance, risk and intertemporal inequalities are are the same thing. Uh, whereas in the abstention preference, you assume that you have a different attitude toward risk and from uh, the, your attitude toward the word uh, intertemporal inequalities. So that's make uh, the, the approach difficult to, to calibrate here in, from a normative point of view. And here, of course, I, I have a, this is a normative, normative problem that I want to address here. But how do we value things for society? Resolution, resolution two, which I think is more promising, is to use uh, uh, an approach à la barreau by uh, introducing extreme events uh, or models with persistent shocks that all those things that magnify the longer macroeconomic risk. Uh, so you, you make autoregressive, autoregressive uh, growth model or Markov process or parametric uncertainty in that, in that kind of model. All those things will generate a solution potential solution for the for the risk free rate puzzles and the equity premium puzzles so yes uh, let me let me stop here uh, and here is an example here is an example where you assume you have a you face a geometric brownian motion but you don't know the trend the trend is a constant but you don't know what it is you will learn over time and if you do that uh, you get a, a, a term structure for the risk free rate which looks like that and uh, a risk adjust, adjusted uh, discount rate for different value of beta that correspond to these other curves. And you see that for long maturity, here I go to 300 years, well, <laughs> because I use, I'm used now to estimate, to evaluate project with such large uh, uh, time duration, climate change is an, an issue, or you know, the uh, management of nuclear waste is another issue where 300 years is not really <laughs> a, a, a very large uh, maturity for the problem. And you see for long, long maturity, the, um, the, the discount rate that you should use is highly sensitive to the risk profile of your project. So it's critically important for most projects related to, to the environment, for all projects related to well, long-term issues like sustainability, to estimate your beta. If you don't do that, you, you will misevaluate or you will wrongly evaluate your project. Uh, so how do we estimate the beta? Um, I will be fast, I will be quick here. Uh, a, a possible approach is to estimate beta from, from financial data, but we have classical issues related to this approach. For example, uh, you know, if you estimate the, the CAPM beta, uh, which where you correlate the benefits of the project, uh, financial benefits of the project uh, with, the, with the return of the market, uh, you, you miss the fact that the market the equity market in particular is highly leveraged. It's a highly leveraged version of the macroeconomic risk. You also have, you also miss the fact that most financial, I mean, this financial uh, return uh, do not take into account of many unpriced externalities of your economic activities under consideration. Well, um, so one possibility is to use model. I have a paper with uh, Frédéric Charbonnier uh, where we link the income elasticity of the surplus of a market uh, to the standard uh, parameters of that market. Uh, in, the, in the competition, you have the income and price elasticity of supply and demand. And from those numbers, uh, you can derive the, uh, the, uh, the beta that you should use for uh, estimating the risk adjustment of your discount rate. Uh, I have no time here to use this, to, to, those ideas to uh, tell you something about what discount rate specifically uh, be used for specific projects like the social cost of carbon. Uh, so for social cost of carbon, 
the benefits of reducing emission is the reduction of damage for the future or the reduction of the effort, uh, mitigation effort you will have to be to do in the future. Uh, what is the beta of that kind of project? I have a paper, I have two papers now, one published with uh, Simon Dietz and, and Louis Kessler, uh, where I show that uh, the, bet, the climate beta, as I call it, is positive and close to one, in fact. Uh, but but, but I, to do that, I use the DICE model, and I recognize in the DICE model, there is a, a, a basic assumption that could be criticized, and I'm sure that uh, that my friend Robert, Robert Bob Pindike will criticize it. Uh, that implied that the beta is close to one when I use the the, the dice model. Um, uh, let me also stress the fact that uh, many many experts around the world put in the discount rate things that should not be there. The discount rate should be used, strictly speaking, uh, to discount future expected benefits. If we do something else, I mean, we will use, start to use different language to talk about the same thing, and that will be uh, the Babel Tower soon. Uh, so, for example, in the UK, uh, as I told you earlier, uh, they use a smaller discount rate for health impact. Why do they do that? They do that because they, they, they say that uh, the, the, the value of health improve with time uh, because the income elasticity of, of health benefit is larger than zero. And that imply uh, that they, as, I, they, as they say, they could use, because the benefit with growth at a given rate why it's better it's simpler to just not take in, into account of the increasing value over time of the benefits it's rather more useful to use a smaller discount rate to take into account uh, of, of this increasing benefits over time I, I don't think it's a good idea if we start doing that uh, we will lose we will lose many people on the road uh, with let us, so let me be clear, I think it's crucially important to define the discount rate as the number used to discount future expected benefits. Okay? Uh, and I face this kind of difficulty in France these days where uh, experts try to, using the model that we, I have been developed, uh, developed for them 10 years ago to because they observe that that imply this model imply that the expected benefit growth uh, grow at, at a given rate over time, which is proportion, which is a quadratic function of the beta. They should they say, oh, but we should discount at a rate which is not the one you propose, Christian. Rather, you should dis deduce from the original discount rate from the consumption-based capital asset pricing model this this natural growth, constant growth rate of expected benefit. Um, <clears throat> So let me finish with before going to my conclusion. Uh, let me let me finish with um, uh, standard fallacies uh, in the debate on uh, the discount rate. The first fallacy is the Arolin fallacies, but Deborah uh, already wrote extensively on, on this issue. A similar uh, uh, fallacy is about the weighted average cost of capital fallacy, where uh, people suggest that firms should discount their, the, 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 their, their, uh, their project at a rate corresponding to, to their cost of capital. This is obviously completely wrong, and that should not be done, but people continue to do that. And uh, let me tell you that if we do that, we, uh, so if, we, if a country or a company use a single discount rate corresponding to their cost of capital, they will misallocate their capital, they will overinvest in risky projects, they will underinvest in, in safe projects, and under my calibration in another paper, I evaluate the welfare loss to an incredibly large number of 20% of, 20 of annual GDP forever, okay, every year. Okay, if you do that, so don't do that. Worse, if you use the Arolin uh, uh, fallacy, Arolin theorem, you use the risk-free rate to evaluate all your project. Of course, you will, so, you will have so many projects that pass the test of a positive net present value that you will have to randomize the allocation of capital in that, in, in that kind of, uh, if you use that kind of strategies and in the same calibration, I get a, 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 a loss, a welfare loss corresponding to 50 person of, uh, of annual GDP every year. So let me finish with, uh, from, from this uh, striking number, let me finish uh, to, by saying 
how is it possible that so inefficient discounting system around the world in, in clever countries like the US uh, are allowed to survive for so long? And, and last statement, uh, it, doing that, this inefficiency generates such a sinister farce of the Trumpian social cost of carbon of $1 per ton of CO2 estimated by in your, in your administration a few years ago. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christian. So um, let's go on to our second presentation, which is Kip Wiskusi. Uh, thanks, Debbie. Um, I'm going to be talking about the legal and philosophical underpinnings of discounting. In the legal environment, <laughs> my uh, energy saving lighting is just not enough. That was my only contribution to stopping climate change. Uh, the legal environment is fairly predictable uh, based on past uh, legal decisions. Uh, there are legal constraints on what government agencies can do in setting the discount rate, uh, but the courts do not exercise independent judgments on the correct discount rate. So what I'm gonna be doing is reviewing uh, past cases to provide some insight into the leeway that agencies have and how they can make choices that won't be overturned uh, by the courts. I'll also say a bit about the philosophical justifications for setting the discount rate and these justifications very widely. Uh, and even if we accept the idea that the social rate of discounts should reflect society's preferences, it need not be tied to financial uh, markets. We have to decide whose preferences count and what these preferences are. Well, the main uh, statutory guidance for determining the acceptability of discount rates or any government action is the Administrative Procedure Act. Agencies cannot undertake actions that are arbitrary, capricious, and abuse of discretion, or otherwise not in accordance with the law. And the principal case relating to this, the act is the Chevron case, Chevron versus National Resources Defense Council, in which the United States Supreme Court granted agencies substantial deference. So essentially, if Congress has clear-cut instructions, agencies must follow it. But if there's ambiguous language of the intentions uh, of the uh, Congress, then courts will be deferential to agencies and they won't substitute their independent judgment. Uh, nevertheless, there have been dozens of cases challenging regulatory impact assessments, including regulatory uh, analyses that have been overturned based on the discounting practices they've used. Well, the first issue I addressed is, is discounting permissible. So is it okay for government agencies to discount? So we can surely discount financial losses, but what about non-monetary impacts? So for example, can we discount lots? Uh, well, this discounting practice was challenged uh, with respect to the EPA asbestos rule, and the court upheld the 3% discount rate that was used rejected a 0% discount rate and did say it was okay to discount non-monetary effects, which I'll get into uh, later. What we're really doing, we're not discounting lives, which is what EPA did. We're discounting society's willingness to pay for the benefit, uh, which is somewhat different. The court did conclude that we need to discount to make uh, these impacts in the future comparable uh, to other deferred impacts. So discounting is certainly an accepted practice. But what if the agency at some point decides, well, we're only gonna take the analysis out for a particular period of time, then we're gonna stop it. In effect, they're applying an infinite discount rate after the end of that time horizon. Uh, in, a, in the decision relating to the asbestos rule, the court concluded that the 13 year time horizon that the agency used was too short and sure. Of course it's too short because it's a one or two decade latency period before the effects of asbestos even are uh, exhibited. A starker example of a time, long time period being desirable is the DC circuit decision uh, regarding uh, the uh, Yucca Mountains Nuclear Waste Depository. EPA had done an analysis analyzing the risk for the next 10,000 years. And given that reported human history is only a few thousand years old, I thought that 10,000 years would have been fine, but the court said no. 
this was too short a time period. And good luck on estimating what the benefits and costs are after 10,000 years. Uh, some legal scholars advocate ignoring impacts uh, that are more than 30 or 40 year, 50 years from now, uh, but I don't think that's going to hold up, certainly when you look at climate change uh, policies, which almost all of the effects are in the future. Uh, the court in another case has ruled that an agency rule would be arbitrary and capricious if it's entirely failed to consider an important aspect of the problem. Certainly an important aspect of the climate change problem is what's gonna happen 50 years from now, 100 years from now. So the short-term analysis certainly would not be accepted. So what does the agency have to do to justify the particular discount rate that it picked? So the main questions that uh, the courts have asked are, did the agency use the best available evidence? Did they use relevant and reliable data? And did they provide a sound economic rationale for the choice? So if you can check all these boxes, then you're pretty much on your way. Uh, OMB Circular A4 is the principal guidance for United States discounting practices for government regulations. Agencies are free to use a 3% rate which, he, which OMB regards as the social rate of discount rate, or a 7% rate, which it regards as the real rate of return. And OMB did show the footwork for how it got there. OMB has also said that agencies can use lower, non-zero rates below 3% for intergenerational discounting, but with two caveats. First, it didn't say what these numbers were. So what are these lower rates below 3%? And second, even if an agency chooses to use a preferential discount rate for some, something like climate change policies, then it still must show what happens using a 3% rate and a 7%. Obama's social cost of carbon analysis used 2.5%, 3%, and 5%. But Trump reverted to 3% and 7%. Uh, there have been some proposals that we should use a 2% rate. Regardless of what rate the agency picks, they have to explain uh, what they're doing. In an appliance energy efficiency analysis case, uh, the Department of Energy used a 10% rate, which at the time was the rate recommended by OMB, and the courts overturned that rate, uh, not because the number was bad, but just because the agency had not done a good enough job explaining why it picked that particular number. So deference to OMB and the official government rate was not a sufficient uh, defense, because they did not justify the reasoning that got them. Um, what about sidestepping all of this and instead of worrying about all of these cases that involve non-monetary impacts, perhaps we can get some guidance from cases involving only financial losses, and that doesn't really much help either. Uh, we know that the card does some sensible thing. So in the Pacific the Gas explained the difference between its 15% cost of capital versus the lower discount rate for consumers, the court upheld what they were doing. And they also upheld uh, the cost of capital based on the capital asset pricing model. But the court itself does not come in and say, yes, this is a particular number that you should use. So there's no legal standard for calculating the interest rate that should be used in valuing lost profits and contract disputes. The particular number that they want to use is left to the fact finder. So juries and judges have produced inconsistent and vague uh, rationales regarding the particular discount rate. Uh, what the courts do do is that they general oppose, generally oppose the total offset rule, where you assume the numerator is going at the same rate as the discount rate, so you can forget about discounting altogether. There's some situations where that does happen, where you have to actually show that the growth rate the numerator is the same as the denominator before you can forget about our discount. More recently, there have been numerous cases involving the 3% and 7% discount rates that OMB has uh, advocated for regulatory impact analyses. And the courts have generally accepted these rates based on current OMB recommended practices. So that's where we stand on the legal issues. Essentially, you can have substantial leeway provided, you can provide a compelling justification uh, for what you're doing. Let me now turn to the philosophical issues. First, why not use a zero discount rate? So even if the pure rate of time preference is zero, 
the appropriate rate of discount will not be zero because the cause of the growth rate and per capita income. Uh, you might think, well, maybe using a zero discount rate would be nice to future generations. The problem with the zero discount rate is that $1 in permanent harm causes an infinite amount of loss. So we're never likely to do anything that will have a permanent effect. Uh, zero discounting also makes it desirable to postpone projects since you can earn interest on these, uh, on your uh, money in the interim. You can take advantage of technological change by postponing your actions. And you can also benefit by greater benefit levels in the future because of the positive income elasticity of the valuation of benefits. But what about the discounting of non-monetary benefits? And this was a big controversy after EPA discounted future lives, but really we're not, we're not discounting lives, we're not discounting environmental quality, we're discounting society's willingness to pay uh, for these benefits. I've estimated the in international income elasticity of the value of statistical life is 1.0 internationally, it's at least 0 0.6 in the United States. And if you make these adjustments, it does boost the future benefits uh, once you do the calculations. In effect, the net discount rate is lower, but I, do not, I agree with Christian Goyer, I do not advocate using a lower discount rate simply for health related uh, benefits. I'd rather put it in the numerator and benefits are growing at a certain rate, you can take that in, into account. Um, one issue I brought up in my paper is that conceivably doomsday policies leading to extinction of the human race could pass a benefit cost test. There could be some probability uh, that all life will be exterminated in the future and still find the action desirable. Whether or not such things would make any sense depends on who is standing and making these decisions. So I think that's a key issue in uh, worrying about discount rates in the very, very long run. So are we maximizing the social welfare of the current country's current population, <laughs> including altruism, or do we have a, a somewhat broader perspective? So uh, do we have a, a Rawlsian approach where you don't know which generation you'll be in? Uh, well, fortunately, we do know which generation we're in, and I think uh, the current social preferences are going to be a little selfish in what we do. Uh, another issue is should our desire to have a preferential discount rate for the next generation be consistent with their own intergenerational discount rate? So let's say the current generation will live to the year 2100, the next generation will live to the year 2200. If we're discounting effects that go between 2100 and 2200 using our preferential future generation generation discount, is this the same rate of discount that they too would choose to use during that 2100 to 2200 period? So there might be an, an inconsistency in the discounting we would prefer for them and that they would prefer uh, for themselves. A number of authors have suggested, well, what if future generations could bargain costly with us? What would the discount rate be? Uh, this is a great framing. Uh, but unfortunately, we don't get paid, and we also don't know uh, their preferences. Uh, the social rate of prefer time preference versus the opportunity cost of capital. Uh, if people would prefer more saving than they do individually, then the social rate of time preference uh, will be lower. Uh, there's a more serious problem, though, with thinking about the social rate of time preference, since we really don't know that much about society's preferences regarding effects more than 100 years from now, uh, since we have very little experience in even thinking about the choice of such things. Intertemporal equity has come up. Uh, I think equity issues should be kept separate from discounting. If you're gonna adjust anything, you can adjust the benefits. We are richer and healthier than past generations. That's true, likely to be of future generations. So to the extent that we're doing a favor to future generations, we're doing a favor to richer future generations. It's also the case that climate change policies will disproportionately benefit people who are currently in less developed countries and they're poor, they're not rich. Uh, so the question then becomes what degree of altruism do we have uh, toward them recognizing that they're not necessarily that well off. Uh, international discount rates also come up. 
uh, with respect to the social cost of carbon. So are we only counting for domestic benefits of the, of the uh, when we do the social cost of carbon analysis? Uh, Ted Geyer and I have argued, this is what is consistent with statutory guidance. All that matters are the benefits to the United States. This includes altruism, as well as the value of reciprocity. So if the focus is on the United States only, then we can use the domestic uh, discount rate. If the social cost of carbon also includes all international benefits, then the appropriate discount rate to use for the non-US benefits should presumably be the discount rates of the affected countries. As Christian Goliath indicated, those discount rates are not the same as the United States. They may vary considerably, you know, 3% in Germany to 15% in the Philippines. Well, to conclude, uh, the legal constraints uh, don't give you the answer. Uh, they provide the guardrails for economically justified discount rates. The courts are never going to wait in and say, this specific, specific number is the right discount rate. Uh, agencies have considerable discretion, but their choices uh, must not be arbitrary and capricious. If you're adopting a discount rate from OMB, don't simply cite the Office of Management and Budget, couple that discount rate choice with some justification. Asserting that we care a lot about climate change and future generations doesn't pin down the rate. Uh, any discount rate, once you recognize that the fact that the discounting also implies that benefits are also likely to be rising over time, uh, also suggests that the future is not as bleak as it might look uh, once you uh, do discounting. Uh, legal rules are driven by precedent, but we're really on pretty novel terrain. There aren't that many policies with effects that have been analyzed with impacts more than 50 years down the pike. So until we resolve how this is going to play out, I said there's a lot of uncertainty as to which discount rates will be upheld and which one. So that's the end of my comments. Thanks very much, Kip. And our last presenter before the discussion is Jeff Healy. Jeff, floor is yours. Thanks. See if I can find my slides. Looks like the right ones there. Great, can you see the screen now? Yes. Right. Okay, very good. Okay, so um, this is a joint paper with Anthony Milner, who's also online somewhere. Uh, yes, there is. Um, it's, I'm going to give a short summary of what is actually a very long paper. It's a 72-page paper. Um, Bob, I hope, has read the whole thing. Um, and it's a, it's a review. Uh, it's not focusing on a particular aspect of the, of the problem. Um, as Christian did, for example, it's a review of what we know about choosing discount rates for long-term projects. So there are basically what we do is we identify three possible frameworks for thinking about how to discount long-term projects. <clears throat> um, one is to consult the market, look for information from the marketplace. This is probably the single approach which is most widely used in practice by governments. Um, the second alternative is to imagine a benign planner who considers the interests of all generations and then ask what the benign planner would choose. And that's probably the default approach in academia. Uh, amongst theorists who thought about this, this is probably the default approach. This is what Ramsey did in his original paper on optimal growth theory back in the 1920s. I think that most people who have written in that, that vein about this have worked in that context. Finally, the third alternative is to treat discount, discount rates as individual values, individual ethical choices, recognize that they can legitimately differ from person to person, and look for a social choice mechanism that reconciles or synthesizes the various disparate discount rates in a society. And let me just emphasize, there really is a lot of disagreement about discount rates. And this is a result of a rather interesting survey that carried out by Drup et al. a couple of years ago. We carried out a survey of all the people who have written extensively about intertemporal discounting, long-term discounting, <clears throat> asking both for their best estimate of the pure rate of time preference, which is on the horizontal axis here, and for their estimate of the right elasticity of marginal utility consumption, which you can see on the vertical axis here. And each of these points represents an answer response. So there's some people who thought that both numbers should be zero. 
that some people have thought the social rate of this count should be as high as the pure over time preference story should be as high as 8%, um, 7% there, 6% there, but a big clump obviously between zero and one. And then again, estimates of the elasticity varied from zero up to about five, four, three, but the majority in the range of zero to two. Okay. Now that's a, a very wide range. And one of the things we calculate in the paper is that if you consider the value of $1 100 years ahead, and you compare the value that this person here places on it with the value that this person here places on it, they differ by a factor of 500,000. So you've got two people included in this survey, all of whom were considered to be authorities in the field, differing by this huge factor of half a million in how much value they place on $1 100 years ahead. So that's just emphasizing the point that there really is an issue here. There's a lot of disagreement even amongst people who consider themselves experts in this field on what is the right rate to discount over long periods of time. So I mentioned three alternatives, the market approach, the benign planner approach, the social choice approach. And I'll talk briefly about each of those. It's a couple of slides on each of those. So the market is supposed to synthesize individual preferences and give us information about the preferences. But obviously we're looking 50 to 100 years ahead as we have to in, in, in climate change issues. A lot of those who are going to be affected are not present in the market. So their preferences about future consumption paths are not registered in the market. There's also a huge range of, of market imperfections that prevent the market from really feeling the, the right rate of time preference. Uh, related to the first point I made, obviously markets are incomplete, uh, massively incomplete. I mean, for to be able to read the uh, read a reasonable estimate of the uh, of the right discount rate from market, we need to believe that there are markets for future consumption uh, 50 or 100 years ahead and in all possible states of the world. Obviously, we don't have uh, futures markets going that far ahead, and we certainly don't have state contingent markets going. We could depend on all the relevant states. So we've got a problem of incomplete markets. Um, <clears throat> We've got externalities, obviously. Climate change has been described as the, the greatest external effect in human history. And we've got public goods. And we know that in, in presence of externalities and public goods, again, we don't expect the market to lead to an efficient solution. And therefore, we can't really read the, the optimal discount rate off from the market. Just to give my, elaborate on one of these points. So we don't talk about climate change as an externality. So with no externalities and a standard Ramsey model, now, the first order optimality condition is this equation I've got here. Marginal product of capital should equal the social discount rate is equal to delta plus eta c dot over c, where delta obviously is the discount rate, eta is the elasticity, and c dot over c is the rate of growth of consumption. Now, if you derive that same first order condition from something like Bill Nordhaus's DICE model, where you've got a, uh, a damage function, D, which is a function of the temperature, T sub E, um, then, and you've got the temperature, which is a function of, uh, of, of the, the rate of change of the temperature, sorry, a function of the uh, output. Um, and you've got our, otherwise our standard capital accumulation model. Then if you grind for the first order conditions for that, you find this. Um, and the parts which differ from the previous equation uh, for the, with, with no externalities are the ones that are in red, obviously. So, um, if you, assume, if you assume away externalities, you've got F prime equals delta plus e dot, e to c dot over c. If you allow for the externalities, you have these additional terms in red here. Um, so if you try to read off uh, an appropriate discount, just neglecting for a moment the fact that there's no futures markets, there's no appropriate state contingent markets and so on. If we assume that all of that is given, but you try to read off from the uh, market information um, the right uh, social, social discount rate, you can be making a massive error by neglecting these two terms in red, which in the case of something like climate change could be really quite substantial. So markets are gonna give an inaccurate signal, uh, particularly in the case of climate change where you've got a, a really large scale externality. There are lots of other reasons actually for, for querying market rates. Um, and we discussed these uh, in the paper. Um, for example, people may have inaccurate beliefs about the future, which could lead them to make inaccurate bets. Um, there may be market power, which can distort these things. There's an interesting argument by Kaplan and Leahy, which we develop in the paper, uh, which says that uh, if you're thinking about what's happening, looking at people's, people's time preferences at time t plus delta, the choices made at time t, sometime in the past, but bind people's choices for multiple periods, uh, then the, what you can observe at t plus delta doesn't necessarily reflect time preferences at t plus delta. 
So it's, it's an interesting point. Um, and there's several other points of this type. We clearly want to believe that uh, it's really very difficult to obtain useful information about long-term discount rates from working at markets. So that brings me to the sort of the academic default, which is benign planners. Typically, we think about planners as maximizing a utilitarian objective where the utility function is typically given by something which is isoelastic like this. Um, now, solving a problem like this obviously requires that we pick failures for delta and eta. Um, and uh, Kip was talking about the difficulty just now in picking a value for delta. Um, both of these are highly controversial. There is, for example, a strong constituency uh, for delta equals zero, but there's also quite vociferous dissent from that. Um, give you the strong constituency. Of course, famously, Ramsey in his early paper said that uh, discounting of future utilities is ethically indefensible and arises purely from the weakness of the imagination. Harrod, one of his contemporaries, said that discounting is a polite expression for rapacity on the conquest of reason by passion. Pigou, who developed much of what we think of as the welfare economics of, of the environment today, said that discounting implies that our telescopic faculty is defective. I think a more recent comment is Bob Solo said that in solemn conclave assembled, so to speak, we ought to act as if the social rate of time preference was zero. But um, there's a problem with this, which is that if we set delta equal to zero, it implies extraordinarily high savings rate, much too high to make sense. And actually Ramsey recognized this in his paper. So at the beginning of his paper, he said we should always set the discount rate equal to zero, the period of time preference that is. But at the end, he says, actually, if you do that, you get a ridiculously high savings rate. Um, he, he sort of finesses the issue, I think, to be frank. Um, Ken Arrow had a very interesting comment on this, which I, I like, which we quote on the paper. He says, I therefore conclude that the strong ethical requirement that all generations be treated alike, itself reasonable, contradicts a very strong intuition that it's not morally acceptable to demand excessively high savings rates of any one generation or even of every generation. So Ken, I think there is saying that um, there's implicitly a conflict, a contradiction uh, in the utilitarian approach with delta equal to zero. Diamond, in a famous paper in Econometry, actually proved that. He proved that there are no orderings over infinite utility streams, but a continuous Pareto and indifferent to permutations of the date. Uh, so you really cannot, in fact, treat all generations equally and maintain some pretty basic desiderata like being Pareto and being continuous. So that raises a question. So that, 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 that emphasized that after a century of argument, and, and um, Henry's paper is almost 100 years old now, after a century of argument, there's still no agreement on the right values for delta and eta. Um, even if we could agree on those, is discounted utilitarianism the right approach? Now, Koopmans famously axiomatized the discounted utilitarian approach. It's a very elegant paper, but his axioms actually are really quite restrictive. So the conditions under which uh, discounted utilitarianism makes sense are fairly limited. Just Sorry, I had a phone call coming in there. Um, the bottom line is that there's, when we talk about benign planners, there's no agreement on the parameters that a utilitarian planner should use. There isn't even agreement that the utilitarian approach is the right framework for thinking about this. Um, there seems to be a fundamental contradiction in some ways in, in, in picking a low discount rate while using utilitarian approach. So that brings me to the third alternative, which is social choice. Um, the idea here is that you see people's values, people's estimates of delta and eta as part of their value systems. Um, there's no right or wrong values of delta or eta. And a lot of ink has been spilled on arguing about whether this value of delta or that value of delta is the right value. Uh, this approach says, well, there isn't the right value. The different people can quite legitimately have different values for delta and eta and can differ in good faith. Uh, we can differ over the value of delta just as we can differ over what is the right distribution of income, for example. So what we need to do is to find a way of moving from differing values on parameters like delta and eta to an acceptable social choice. And that, of course, is exactly the issue that Ken Arrow was talking about in his book, Social Choice and Individual Values, um, more than half a century back now. <clears throat> now, there are several different, uh, different approaches here. 
uh, we could maximize a sum of utilities. That's a utilitarian approach to making a social choice, or we could vote for different approaches. And in the paper, we explore both of these. Um, utilitarian case, we're just maximizing, as I said, a weighted sum of utilities. And if you, if you work through the math of that, it turns out that the social discount rate is given by this expression here, but delta tilde is a generalized mean of the individual discount rates, and eta tilde is a generalized mean of the, uh, of the individual values of eta. Um, so you can get a social discount rate, which is related to the individual discount rates, the individual rates of time preference and the individual elasticities. Um, but it, it changes over time, it declines over time, okay? Um, in fact, it declines asymptotically to the minimum of all of the individual discount rates. This is just a graph of how it might decline over time, taken from the paper. Um, <clears throat> now, with a declining discount rate, intertemporal choices, of course, are not time consistent. Okay, um, we may wish to revise at some future date the choices we've made in the past. We argue that's not a problem with intergenerational choices. We're modeling preferences of successive groups who may be separated by decades or centuries. There's no particular reason to suppose that these preferences should be sufficiently aligned for preference to be time consistent. So what we do in this case is we look at a Nash equilibrium between generations. We suppose that generations essentially play a game. Uh, and in the case of a linear production function, it's possible to get analytical results for this. Um, and we can work out that the resulting path is the path of a single agent uh, who behaves as a discounted utilitarian with a pure rate of preference equal to a weighted harmonic mean of the individual discount rates. And that's a weighted harmonic mean right there. The outcome turns out to be inefficient, uh, but better options, efficient options are not implementable because of the time inconsistency. The alternative approach is voting. So we assume that each generation votes over the current consumption level uh, and we can show that the outcome, the equilibrium consumption path is then the optimal path of the median voter. Um, and we can show that members of a generation have single peak preferences, but over alternative utilitarian optimal paths. What is interesting about this is that a majority of agents will always prefer the voting equilibrium to the utilitarian equilibrium, regardless of how preferences are aggregated in the utilitarian approach. Um, indeed, we can actually go on to show that the voting outcome can actually dominate the utilitarian for everybody, uh, even according to utilitarian preferences, provided that there's a certain condition satisfied on the distribution of discount rates. In particular, the harmonic mean has to be less than the median, has to be less than the arithmetic mean. So this is the harmonic mean discount rate. This is the median discount rate. This is the arithmetic mean discount rate. And if this condition is satisfied, then even utilitarians will prefer, prefer the voting outcome to the utilitarian outcome. And this condition here is, uh, now the harmonic mean is anyway always less than the arithmetic mean. So this is actually only a restriction on the median and would be satisfied for any positively skewed distribution. So conclusions, um, markets really don't give us enough information to determine long-term social discount rates. There are too many problems there. The benign utilitarian planner framework we can't reach agreement on the key parameters. And there seems to be an unavoidable clash between what the current generation owes itself and what it owes the future. The alternative is to think of delta I and eta I as individual values, individual ethical choices, and to seek a social choice rule that gives a reasonable social choice in the face of diverging individual values. The voting outcomes here have interesting and attractive properties. In particular, they're preferred by most or all agents to utilitarian outcomes. Okay, thank you, Debbie. Thank you very much, Jeff. And I will say thank you very much, Jeff Heal, because I realize I misspoke your last name at the beginning. Um, that was I'm used to that. great. <laughs> um, so I want to turn it now over to the discussant, our own Bob Pindyke. He's also been an important thought leader on this and related topics. Um, in fact, I'll put it in an advertisement for him. There is a link to his advance to an advanced copy of his newest book on uh, the conference website 
called Climate Future, Averting and Adapting to Climate Change. And it'll be coming out in print soon, but you can download it there if you're interested. So Bob, over to you. Thank you. And I don't have any uh, PowerPoints or slides to present. I'm just going to talk a little bit. And, uh, you know, when I wrote the book, I thought I'd learn what the correct discount rate is as a result of this conference. These were really interesting papers, but I don't know what the right discount rate is for uh, climate damages in 100 years. I'm actually being facetious. Let me begin. Um, these were indeed interesting papers, but let me just begin with a few general remarks about this question of how we should think about long-term discounting. And I wanna do it in the context of climate change. And uh, it's actually quite amazing. So think about estimating the social cost of carbon. And um, as I think most of you know, the estimates of the social cost of carbon vary really all over the place. I mean, they've, I've seen estimates as low as $10 a ton, a metric ton uh, to $300 a metric ton, huge variation. And the social cost of carbon is very important if we want to design or develop a climate policy, for example, a carbon tax, you want to know what the SEC is. Um, so wh why is this? What's, what's the problem? And it's sort of interesting. There, there are two parts to the problem. The first part <clears throat> has to do with science and economics. So, uh, you know, we know that uh, if we continue to emit uh, carbon dioxide, it's going to accumulate in the atmosphere and that will affect temperature and higher temperatures could affect GDP broadly defined. The social cost of carbon is defined as the value, the impact of uh, the external impact uh, or the external cost of one additional ton of CO2. So if we want to estimate the social cost of carbon, you start out with asking, all right, you know, we, we have a trajectory, we're going to emit uh, a little more CO2, okay, what does that do to the atmospheric concentration? Well, we have a pretty good idea about how it increases the atmospheric concentration. What does that do to temperature? Well, now it's getting, there's a lot of uncertainty. This is, this is a, a parameter called climate sensitivity. There's a range of estimates, but that's okay. We can pick a number in the middle. And then we have to go from climate sensitivity to temperature. We have to go from temperature uh, to damages. What is the impact? on the economy, uh, and again, broadly defined, we're going to try to monetize adverse health effects, mortality, and so on. Well, unfortunately, when we go from uh, climate change itself, whether it's higher temperatures, higher sea levels, to damages, we know virtually nothing. The models have damage functions, but those damage functions are essentially ad hoc. They're made up and the reason is that we have no theory. We don't have any economic theory. We don't have any physical theory um, of how higher temperatures will affect the economy. And we have no data. We've never experienced a temperature increase of three degree, two degrees, three degrees, four degrees Celsius. So this lack of, you know, of theory and lack of data means we really can't say much. We also don't know how much adaptation there would be because climate change will occur slowly. It isn't all of a sudden. All right. So those are things that, you know, we, we understand why there's uncertainty. We could argue about the uncertainty, uh, but it's kind of in the economics and the physics. Let's suppose there wasn't any uncertainty. Suppose we did know what the impact would be on GDP, would make it GDP broadly defined, of an extra ton of CO2 over the next 100 or 150 years. And now what we need to do is put that in present value terms. And that's where we need the discount rate. And to me, it's quite amazing that, uh, and Jeff said this, you know, 100 years um, of, of uh, argument over what the right discount rate is, and we don't have a clue. There is huge disagreement over what the correct discount rate is. You know, uh, in the Obama administration, they set up a, uh, it's called the interagency working group that was tasked with the job of estimating the social cost of carbon. And they did it by taking three integrated assessment models. Whatever you think about those models, fine. But they used these three models, which they simulated. They ran by adding, you add some CO2. But then they had to have a discount rate. So what's the right discount rate? Well, they took 2%, 3%, 5%. And 
Now, what's the right number? Uh, 2% gives you a high uh, social cost of carbon. They average the results of the three models across the models. 2% discount rate gives you a big number. 5% discount rate gives you a very small number. 3% discount rate gives you actually a number of around $40 per ton. That's what they got. And they argued and they argued and they argued. And according to the people that were doing the arguing, there was no agreement. In the end, everybody said, look, we want to go home. And we're never going to reach an agreement. 3% is in the middle. Let's use 3%. And that's what they did. They never claimed ever that 3% is in any way the correct number. There is no correct number in all the work the interagency working group did. It's in the middle and everybody wants to go home. So, you know, uh, this is really kind of amazing that here we are and we can't agree. Lots of problems with market interest rates, you know, um, as uh, uh, both Kip and Jeff explained, although some people still argue we should use them or at least take them into account. There's the ethical argument, um, and Jeff gave us several quotations, or Ramsey and others, who said that it's unethical to use a rate of time preference that's greater than zero. It should be zero. Well, why should it be zero? I mean, if we're going to use an ethical argument about discounting future utility, why zero? Um, I think most of you, those of you who have children, would argue, would agree with me uh, with the argument that our children are better people than we are, right? I mean, my kids are better people than I am. And probably our grandchildren will be even better still and great-grandchildren better yet. So if we think these are better and better people, then that says that we should have a negative uh, rate of time preference, not zero, negative. And that, of course, can get us to a, to a very low discount rate. So the problem with this ethical argument is that well, at least for economists, when I went to grad school, we didn't do much in the way of ethics. We weren't told what the right ethical rate of time preference is. So we have this problem. And uh, those who would like to come up with a high social cost of carbon, and we see this in the work of Nick Stern, for example, um, look, either use ethics or look for some other way <clears throat> to get a lower discount rate. And one way, as Christian explained, is through uncertainty. And uh, uncertainty can reduce the discount rate in a variety of ways. One way is simply the normal fluctuations in consumption or the stock market uh, will give you a reduction in the rate, even through a modification of the Ramsey formula, but it's small, very, very small, won't do much. If on the other hand, you have jumps, you assume that there are rare disasters uh, in which GDP will drop by 50%, um, well, that will give you a lower rate. That can have a big impact, actually, on the rate in a, in a modified Ramsey setting. Uh, but the problem is we don't have a way to estimate the arrival times and magnitudes and distributions of those drops, of those, uh, uh, of those jumps, because they're rare events. So by definition, because they're rare events, we can't estimate them. We don't have enough. There haven't been enough of those events taking place. So that's a problem. Another way to do it is to look at uncertainty over future rates. We just think of future rates are uncertain, and therefore, from Jensen's inequality, that's going to reduce the current rate. That's another argument um, that we can use. So, um, you know, we, we look for ways, and, and maybe these are ways to get a lower rate, um, uh, a lower discount rate, but um, how much it can lower it is it's unclear. A Christian talked about the beta, using beta, and many people have argued that the beta for climate change is negative. I don't understand that, um, the, the idea that somehow the benefits from reducing climate damages will be greater in bad states of the world. Uh, that's not clear to me at all. If you think of climate change uh, as reducing GDP, you know, it says it's going to reduce GDP, period. So high GDP means a greater, a greater benefit. Um, but, the, but the people argue for somehow, I don't understand the argument, that there ought to be a negative beta. So people look for these ways of getting, um, uh, you know, of getting uh, the discount rate to be reduced. I sort of end up here, uh, and one more thing about uh, Jeff and Antony's, the, the Hale Milner argument about aggregating people's preferences. People don't know their preferences. How do we get those preferences? I mean, it's a nice idea, but I, I don't quite see the practical application. 
I kind of go in the end with what Kip said, that in the end, it really comes down to uh, social preferences. You know, look at it this way. Um, it's, there's a good chance that uh, if the temperature increases by three degrees Celsius, which I think is actually, I argue in my book, is quite likely, uh, no matter what we do, no matter what we try to do, it's quite likely. You know, it's possible that a place like Tuvalu, these small island nations, will go underwater, will be the end of it. And some would argue that that's simply, we can't let that happen, period. So forget the discount rate, look at that as a social preference. I, I don't take that view, but there's some who do. But I think in the end, that's kind of what it boils down to. I think in the end, what's gonna happen is that people say, look, we just don't want to damage uh, the environment. And you know that, if that kind of, implies a very low discount rate, then maybe that's the right result because we're not getting anywhere with theory and empirics so far. So let me stop because I know we want to have um, audience discussion. Great. Um, thank you, Bob. So let me start, I guess, by taking, well, let me actually start by seeing if any of the um, presenters <coughs> want to respond to any of that. Uh, Debbie, yes, just one thing on the last, on the, on the last uh, sentence of uh, Bob, I, I agree with him that uh, going through the social cost of carbon uh, generate these incredible difficulties uh, of estimating damage and estimating the right discount rate. And I, I agree with him that probably uh, the a better solution today is to go for, uh, you know, what is already going on which is let us decide about uh, going to two degrees Celsius target. Uh, and then the question, how do we allocate the intertemporal carbon budget constraint into emissions over the next uh, 60 years? Uh, and so that, that, one, that one solution to just eliminate the problem of choosing the discount rate. Okay, well, there is a question um, that came in from Laura Codras, um, who this is also directed to you, Christian, um, which asks, how do the benefit, how do you estimate the benefits of a project? Uh, you seem to assume that there's some sort of data set to use to be estimated for the beta, but can you really obtain estimates of the benefits? You know, costs seem relatively easy, I would add difficult too, but benefits are really difficult. So uh, how do you really think about this with benefits in practice? Uh, this, well, this trickles also back to sort of Bob's comments on what the beta really is. Yeah, well, remember, if you want to do cost-benefit analysis, you need to estimate the benefits, the flow of future net benefits. So normally, if you are a normal evaluator, you will have to do that. Uh, and of course, there is a lot of uncertainty in many dimensions. So for example, uh, keep mention uh, discussion about how to evaluate uh, uh, a disposal of nuclear waste um, for the next 3 million years. Uh, this is a, extremely difficult because uh, it, uh, it, it, it is determined by how do we value the environment in one million years? How do we value life in one million years? Uh, so it's an issue, but but if we don't do that, uh, which is the condition to do cost-benefit analysis, uh, well, forget about economics. Uh, so, so if you estimate benefits, you get at a side product an estimation of the beta because the beta is just the income elasticity of this uh, of this benefit. So you, you so typically what I do is and I do, do that in France for different projects, public and private projects. You you do Monte Carlo simulation. So you you have a model that determines the cost and the future cost and the future benefits of your project. Uh, where the source of uncertainty is, you know, things on cost, labor cost, capital cost. Uh, you estimate the social benefit. You make estimation of social benefit coming from growth. Wealthier people will value more or less your product uh, or your services if you think of an infrastructure. And so you you do all those estimation of your model. You do Monte Carlo simulation if you want to introduce uncertainty in the different parameters 
of the, of the model. And from that, uh, you get uh, two source inform information, the net benefits in each state and the aggregate consumption in each state. And you just compute the, uh, the, 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 the OLS, uh, OLS estimator of the, of the regression of the log consumption, of the log benefit on the log consumption. So it's not, it's not, it's just, just a side product of what we expect most evaluators to do. Yeah, so you, want to, you want to say something? Yeah, I just I, I just wanted to comment on Bob. Um, really enjoyed your remarks, Bob, as always. Um, thought-provoking. <laughs> Guaranteed that you're thought-provoking. Um, your remarks about the interagency working group were interesting. Uh, the fact that they never managed to agree on a discount rate. I actually wasn't aware of that. You obviously have more conversations with them than I have. And um, that in some sense is an argument in favor of the third approach I was talking about that Anthony and I developed in our paper, that, you know, you can't get an agreement on a discount rate. So let's let's actually work with a distribution of discount rates and use some kind of social choice process. You commented that people don't know their preferences, but um, people don't know their preferences for a lot of things, but we resolve the disagreements by voting. Um, you know, so I, mean, I think uh, you have to have some sense of what your preference is. You don't have, it doesn't have to be accurate to do decimal places for this type of idea to work. So that actually relates a little bit to another question that came in, which I think is actually for Kip, which is just to give a little more color on how the different countries talk about how they did choose their discount rates. You know, you show a very wide range and um, I just, uh, I guess, you know, are, what are they thinking about when they're making those choices? Now, my sense is that they're guided mostly by differences in financial markets as opposed to social rates of time preference. And these conditions differ. Now, the riskiness of the investments differ across countries too. So I'm not sure if we're picking riskless rates of return or just total rates of return. Yeah, they, I mentioned a few of them, but yeah, they do vary considerably. I gave you the broad range. So Italy's at 5%, India's at 12%. So there is substantial variation in what they choose is the right discount rate. Now, why you want to use a 12% rate for India? Not sure, uh, but that sort of short changes anybody down the pike. That's a huge discount rate, so. Yeah, well, I might add, I've done quite a bit of work on this and I not only um, is, they, were, they probably are trying to look at their own risk-free rate, and they're probably also not making an adjustment for real or nominal, which is another another problem in all of this. But uh, I think Debbie, yes. yeah, Debbie, just I I I experienced many discussions with different agent, national agencies in Europe uh, that try to reevaluate their uh, discounting system over the last twenty years. My experience is most countries. Uh, Base their estimation of their uh, unique discount rate by using the Ramsey rule. They, they calibrate the Ramsey rule, uh, which is a big problem because implicitly Ramsey rule is useful just for risk-free project. Huh? Uh, and so I try to explain everywhere that it's it's not it's not a good idea. But I, I make basically lose it all the time. I, they always UK, for example, recently decided to stay with the Ramsey rule. Just a bad, a bad idea, but that's what what we have. Bob, you wanted to say something? Yeah, yeah. I just want to, because we're talking about different countries, and I want to clarify one thing, um, and that is when it comes to the social cost of carbon, the only meaningful number is a world number. I mean, if you, if you calculate the social cost of carbon for the United States taken alone, it's going to be very small because we contribute only about 13, 14% of the CO2 emissions, global CO2 emissions. It's only meaningful. See, climate change is a global issue and uh, it doesn't matter where the emissions come from. They accumulate in the atmosphere. So that says you need a social cost of carbon and therefore a discount rate for the world. And I don't know how we're going to do a voting. I mean, it's going to be hard enough to vote in the United States, but we need some... We need some system for aggregating preferences around the world. So let me throw out a question that's very much on my mind um, and a little background, which is I think people here in this discussion could come away with a very nihilistic view of all of this. And I think that's very unfortunate. I mean, everyone I think in this discussion believes we do need to abate carbon. And what this says is, well, we don't really know what the value of that is. And we're not really sure we have any way to come to an agreement on how to calculate it. 
Um, so, you know, I wonder, first of all, I'd you know, love to hear your more affirmative suggestions. And just to throw out um, one thing, I've actually personally decided that although I'm obsessed with discount rates for a lot of public policy issues, I think this is one where we should just forget it in the sense that we've come to an agreement that we need to slow the rate of temperature change and we need a shadow price on carbon and all in order to do that. But do we really need to get there from first principles and discounting because of the ridiculously long time horizons and approximations that seems to involve? So uh, I'll, I'll be quiet and let you all comment on that. One option there, Debbie, would be to take something like a two degree centigrade target as a constraint and say optimize subject to that constraint and then you get a, you get a shadow price coming out on that. That will generate a shadow price on carbon for you. Um, people have done that. I forget the numbers. Maybe Bob's having written his book is more familiar with that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to do it right, and again, it's the whole world, you're gonna you're gonna get a huge number. I mean, to, I think it's almost impossible for us to keep the temperature change from exceeding two degrees. It would take a huge amount. If you just look at the trajectories, forget about the US and Europe. US and Europe are doing okay. We're we're reducing emissions. But you look at Asia, China, uh, Southeast Asia, Vietnam, Indonesia, Malaysia, Bangladesh, India. I mean, their emissions are taking off and they're going to continue to grow. It's just inconceivable that we're going to be able to reduce their emissions enough uh, to really hold down the temperature increase. And that means that, you know, we're going to look at adaptation is going to be the key. It, in my view, that's what we're going to need to work on. What, what is completely clear, Debbie, is that uh, uh, compared to the approach of a social cost of carbon, where the, this, the, where the typical number for the price of or the value of carbon is 50, 60 dollars per ton of CO2, when you do the math for, uh, for the shadow price, I swear, let us take two degrees Celsius and let us see what's the price of carbon that is compatible with the two degrees Celsius, you get much larger numbers. Uh, and that's compatible with what Bob said earlier. I mean, uh, with do, those numbers of the IPC, of the, of the interagency group, uh, we we will go, and the dice model and the recommendation of Nardos we go and, and Nardos recognize it. Uh, we go to at least three degrees three degrees Celsius three degrees Celsius for the for the end of this century and probably much more later on. Let me say something about Debbie's proposal that we take all this as a constraint. I mean, you can't forget benefit cost analysis if you're going to do a government regulation. So you're required to calculate the benefits and calculate the costs. If you go out there with the regulation for which you have not calculated the benefits and costs, that definitely will get overturned by the courts. There's no, no chance that that's gonna pass muster. Now, if you wanna follow the approach of, well, we don't care what the benefits and costs are, we're just gonna do it, then pass it, that's, that's what laws do. So if you pass it, Congress passed the law that we're gonna go out and just do this, you don't have to calculate the benefits and costs. You can just go out and do it without worrying about whether it passes muster uh, once you do the calculations. But, but, but keep, we, we signed the Paris Agreement, and the Paris Agreement says 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius. So, so game over. I mean, we, we already decided collectively to forget about the social cost of carbon, to go, through, uh, to, go to, uh, to a shadow price related to the, to, the, to the climate constraint that we impose to ourselves. Or, or, or we should revise the Paris Agreement. Uh, I don't know. I would view the Paris Agreement as cheap talk from the standpoint of the United States. I think my suggestion was really meant to say that the, you know, the, the honest thing to say is that we think the potential benefits are extremely large because the harms are potentially enormous and we don't know if they're how fast they're going to occur. Um, they're clearly going to occur over many generations. So we have some social willingness to pay a cost and we need a social cost of carbon to put into as inputs into things like carbon taxes to try to provide incentives to get where we need to be. So I'm not sure that I want to throw out the implicit <laughs> idea out the window, but I think the explicit discounting um, for the reasons you've all brought up uh, yeah. won't feel honest to people. <laughs> 
Well, I, I read uh, Bob Pindyke's papers and uh, and the forthcoming book, and so so I I, I agree with him. Uh, uh, we 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 lost the battle. I mean, we we economists have not been able to build a, a model with cre that would generate credible numbers for uh, what will happen next century in terms of GDP loss associated to climate change. And so and and I don't, I'm also a Democrat, and I see my president. Uh, uh, not your president, but, but many, many, many governments and, and, and states have decided to, to say, forget about social costs of carbon. Let us take the two degree census or let us, even worse, I mean, or different. Uh, let us take seriously the zero uh, net emission target by the year 2050 and let's see what carbon price is compatible with that so so, so <laughs> i'm sorry for this session but the the issue there is not anymore or only only marginally about about uh, the discount rate it's really about uh, how what's the uncertainty about technology that will be available in 2050 uh, that will bring us to zero net emission and that's that's has almost nothing to do with with discounting but that, that's because we take seriously a political decision. Well, let me bring in a question that is about this counting, and I happen to know who it's from. It's from Michael Martello, who's a PhD student here at MIT. And I know that he's helping the T um, figure out how much it's worth spending on abating flooding on the transportation lines that are underground. And um, he's interested uh, in part on, um, you know, a lot of the benefits are actually shorter term. You know, we, we, we've been talking about these unknowable long-term effects, but the question is what discount rates should public policy makers be using for projects whose benefits are actually in the shorter run? And I'm curious whether there's um, some thoughts on that from the panel or from Bob. You mean a discount rates for public projects in the shorter run? For public projects in the shorter run. So for instance, project aimed at um, stopping the harms from things like increased flooding probabilities. Right. I actually think that's what we need to do in, in the terms of actions that will deal with climate change. I mean, I think then we're back to more conventional questions of how do you discount public, public create discount rates for public projects? And what is the nature of the risk for those projects there? It seems to me the beta is positive. I think we can sort of get rough estimates. So I think for those things, whether it's a flooding issue or whatever, I think it's much more amenable to coming up with a defensible discount rate. And, you know, we can estimate, we can estimate the benefits much more easily. Um, you know, there's a plan to build a seawall around lower Manhattan to avoid what happened with Hurricane Sandy. The seawall would not have to, you wouldn't see it. It wouldn't go above the surface of the water. It would be below the surface, but it would be enough to prevent waves. It's, it's not to prevent an overall increase in the sea level, it's to prevent surges. That, that's what the problem was with, with Hurricane Sandy. And um, you know there are estimates for what that would cost. Um, and now some people are developing estimates for what the benefits are. That would be a long lived project, but that's something very specific. It's the U.S. You don't have to worry about the world. It's for the U.S. Um, and it's something you can do using more conventional uh, conventional tools. I agree with Bob. I think that specific concrete projects occurring now are more amenable to some of our tools than big general questions like, you know, how much should we spend on tackling climate change or what are the right targets in the climate change area? So let me just, you know, just push one point, which is that... Um, you asked about how we can pick a long-run discount, right? Um, and I still like to push the idea of, the, of, of, of looking at the median, the median rate. I mean, we know that people, there's a distribution of these discount rates. We know that if we were to vote on this by the median voter theorem, we'd get the median rate coming out. Um, and the median discount rate from that survey that I showed you was somewhere in the region of 1.6, 1.7%, I think. That, well, that was the pure rate of time preference, long-term pure rate of time. To answer the question of your PhD student is, I think the, the main question to raise for long-term project or short-term project are the same thing. Uh, does the project, uh, is the project a, 
prevention effort. Uh, if it's prevention that is trying to reduce the damage uh, in the worst case scenario, uh, you should use a relatively small discount rate. If the project is mostly useful in the good state of nature when the US economy is flourishing, use a larger discount rate. So that's, that's the main idea I tried to convey. And that's, it's correct for short term or longer term. Thank you. That's what I've been trying to convince him of too in our other conversations. So thank you for seconding that. So um, Dick Berner actually wanted to join the conversation and he um, noted um, that uncertainty about costs and benefits and Daniel Litterman and Wagner imply a low shadow discount rate, the higher uncertainty, the faster we need to raise the price of carbon. Um, what do you think about that? Do you have that, about that? that comes out of the fact that we think, we don't know what the damage function is. We don't have a damage function, but we think that whatever it is, it's convex. In other words, we think that, you know, the, when you get to larger and larger damages, the incremental effect is greater and greater. Um, and that says that if there's a lot of uncertainty, um, that means the expected damage can be very large because it's the tail that matters. If it's an extremely convex damage function, then you, you may not know what the function is, but at least you can conclude that the greater the uncertainty, um, the greater the damage. Yeah, well, that's, that's a very good question. And it's also related to the climate beta that I mentioned earlier and that... Uh, was raised by uh, an issue raised by, by Bob. Uh, if you believe that the main source of uncertainty in the long run is about whether uh, the uh, world economy will be prosperous or whether we will go back to Stone Age, uh, so when, what, what will be uh, the, the, the total factor of productivity in the economy, uh, the, bet, the beta will be positive. That is, uh, uh, when, if in a good scenario, in a large growth scenario, consumption will be large, emission will be large too, and therefore you will have to abate more than in the business as usual. And because of the convex, uh, the, 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 the emission will be larger, and therefore you, you will have more uh, larger marginal damages. And so there will be a, a larger benefit of fighting climate change, of reducing emission today. So you see large benefit in the good state of nature, uh, uh, smaller benefits in bad state of nature. And so that's explained why you get uh, in, my, in my model with the co uh, 20, 2018, why you, uh, in, my, in my model we get the positive beta. And so we, disc we propose to discount climate change or mitigation investment uh, at a rate around 4% or something like that. Because the beta is positive, we should use a discount rate larger than the risk-free rate. Very good. Well, we are nearing the end of our time, so I don't know if anyone else wants to put in any final thoughts. Maybe we can get some data. You know, Jeff in his paper uh, mentioned the Segovia aqueducts, and of course the Romans built many aqueducts, and I don't know what discount rate they use. We could even go back to the pyramids <laughs> around a long time. We have well, to look and see if we can figure out what the discount rate was. An interesting point. I mean, if you look at a lot of, um, so here in New York, we're still using a lot of infrastructure, which was built in the 19th century. And it shows. <laughs> well, but it works. Uh, if they hadn't invested us, I mean, obviously they over-invested relative yeah. to, you know, relative to a current uh, decision routine, evaluation routine. So, um but we owe them a lot in that respect. Um, I think that uh, the country has been made a lot better by, quote, overinvestment, unquote, by some of our predecessors. Yes. And a lot for that. And we're not doing the same ourselves today. Um, Great. Well, let me thank everyone. And um, we have a, a break for about 12 minutes now for people, at least on the East Coast, to quickly grab lunch. <laughs> and um, thank you all so much. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. <laughs>